Hey, hello, welcome everybody uh, to another Master Gardener class um, on Bear Root Fruit Trees, uh, hosted by Kathleen and Lisa Putnam. Um, welcome to you both. Um, quick uh, note on the chat, if you'd like to send in questions, please send them via um, ask questions here, um, direct those questions there, and then towards the end of the talk, we will address those questions, and Lisa and Kathleen will um, answer those questions as much as possible. Alrighty, so let's get started. Um, welcome to you both, and the floor is all yours. Okay, thanks. Kathleen, do you want me to do an introduction of you? Sure. Okay. Kathleen's my little sister. Way, <laughs> way, way littler. <laughs> and uh, Kathleen has been gardening. Well, really, we've been gardening our whole lives. Our parents were farmers, we're sisters, um, but a master gardener since 2007, 08, and a degree from um, San Francisco, uh, what's the city college? in horticulture and she's an ISA certified arborist and her love is fruit trees and soil. Okay, I'm frozen. Oh, shoot. It's the record thing does it to me every okay. time. Do you just need to start the uh, presentation again? I don't think you have to go out. I think you just have to quit the presentation and start it again. Oh, look, it worked. Okay. okay. So this is about um, bare root fruit trees because now is the time or right after Christmas is when the nurseries, they get rid of all the Christmas stuff and they bring in all their bare root fruit trees. Um, the reason I love this picture is it shows the root flare, which we'll get into more, but <clears throat> I just love this picture. Oh, going the wrong way. Okay, so we're going to cover the basics, um, tree selection, site location, soil preparation, planting, first cut, the most important cut you'll ever make, irrigation, disease prevention, and pest management. So the basics are that um, almost every fruit tree you buy will be grafted. So here, here I, I, I did pictures, but I'll do it over here. So here's the bud union, which is where the graft. So here's your root stock, which controls size, disease resistance, um, precociousness. Soil type that it'll accept. Yeah. And then above it is the variety, which is called the scion. <clears throat> Oops, sorry guys. And then when your trees, if you buy your trees in, at a nursery or if you mail order them, if the site is not prepared, you need <clears throat> to keep those roots moist. And we call that healing them in. So you just find a spot in your garden. I did it in my vegetable bed. I almost always do it in my vegetable bed. I just dig a hole, put the trees in there, cover up the roots, make sure they stay moist. <clears throat> until I'm ready to plant them. And this is really, really important. We had a client last year who ordered a bunch of trees and he just left them in the box for like two weeks, Lisa? Yeah, I think so, yeah. For a couple weeks. And, you know, I, I actually have 100% of my trees survive. So if, if you do this, you, your trees will flourish. If you yeah. don't do this, the roots might dry out and the tree is not going to be a strong, healthy tree. Yeah. And I'll just add, when you're ordering a tree through, let's say, trees of antiquity or one of the mail order, um, they might have sawdust around them, which is moist in, in a bag. But um, and you, you might think that's OK. You might think that'll keep their roots um, moist but really this is way way better than that yeah and those they'll they'll keep those roots moist for a day or two but beyond that they're much better off to just be healed in in somewhere in your yard or a pot if you have like a 
big 10 gallon or 25 gallon pot. Just put them in there, potting soil, keep them moist. The key is keep those roots moist. Okay, why bare root? Um, it's, they're way cheaper. Um, you have way more selection of varieties. You can make the proper pruning from the, from the beginning and they're gonna establish much better, <clears throat> much more readily and naturally. <clears throat> I had a client where all of her apple trees I think she bought 24 inch box. She might've even gotten 36 inch. So they were big trees, but um, they looked the exact same as a tree that was three years old, that was bare root. Yeah. And I'm yeah. sure she paid probably thousands. Yeah. And tr bare roots now are about 40, maybe a little bit, maybe 45. Yeah, I'll just chime in. Save your money. I mean, yeah, pay the 40 bucks instead of the thousands of dollars. I planted a new orchard three years ago. And yeah, my tree looks like a 20 year old tree, you know, other than the fruit production's way better. But yeah, they grow so, if you give them the right conditions, they grow so quickly and they're going to catch up with any box tree within a few years. Yeah, and a box tree is not going to be pruned properly. So it's just like kind of buying a problem for a thousand dollars. So just you know, spend forty five dollars and don't buy a problem. <laughs> tree selection, plant fruit you like to eat. <laughs> I know it sounds really obvious, but um. Like Lisa was just saying before we started this, she has too many plums. And I mean, plums are not my favorite fruit. So I don't have any plums. Uh, my spouse ate an apple this summer, actually this fall, and said, you know, it's, it's really not that good. I, I don't really like this apple. And I said, great, we'll take <laughs> it out and put in a peach. Cause I mean, I don't know about the rest of you, but who doesn't love a peach right off the tree? So yeah. plant what you like to eat. Yeah, peaches are delicious and nectarines are delicious. And one little aside from that is apricots and cherries. Um, apricots, you'll get a good crop about once every five years. And if you have all the space in the world, then yeah, plant some apricots because you have plenty of space. But if you like most, homeowners, you have room for five, maybe seven fruit trees. I actually wouldn't give that space in my, my backyard to an apricot because they're just not reliable enough for a crop. And it's, it's because the rains come when they're blooming and they don't get pollinated and you don't get a crop. Yeah. I also wouldn't plant a cherry because Cherries are just the most difficult trees to grow. They're, they're susceptible to like every disease there is and every insect. And I just don't think they're worth the headache. I know Lisa has some cherries, so. Yeah, I'm gonna chime in. I mean, I love apricots. They're probably, they're one of my favorite fruits. So I went ahead and I planted just a standard Blenheim apricot. Um, it's only three years old. So this was my first year that I let it produce and it, it, it had pretty good production. Um, cherries, on the other hand, I have an orchard in Woodside, mid peninsula for people uh, in the Bay Area, people all around. Um, and on that, that tree was planted about 12 years ago. I don't think I've ever had one cherry off of that tree. <laughs> because <laughs> I mean it'll produce a few it'll produce a handful but then the birds get them before I can net it and the wood is pretty I mean if you want to grow like an ornamental tree the wood's pretty I like the wood on a cherry tree but uh, I know a cherry tree in Atherton but it's probably been there oh, a long long time I'm gonna say 50 years or something 
it produces a ton of cherries that people eat a ton of cherries but I don't know I haven't personally had good luck with cherries apricots and I've done a lot of apricot crosses and um I've had I've had decent luck with apricots okay yeah. that's but if, if you had a small backyard would you put in an apricot I mean if I had five trees I might have one apricot one plum one nectarine and two peaches no apples or pears uh, I would <laughs> I would find a way to espalier an apple somewhere else and um probably no pears yeah hmm. okay <laughs> so here's pictures of this is you type a on an apricot and um you never want to win winter prune an apricot or any of the crosses because they will get this disease it's a fungal disease and it's spread in the rain um splashing and throughout and eventually it'll kill the entire tree this is a cherry uh with molted leaves and this is a cherry and this i see all the time this is a cherry with aphids and people think they have peach leaf curl on their cherry but cherries don't get peach leaf curl only peaches and nectarines get peach leaf curl so um this is just aphids this is how the tree responds to the aphids sucking its juices out. Uh, I'll add one thing. Um, we do have a pruning on uh, January 11th at Link, so we will be teaching a deciduous tree pruning class. But I will say, so Kathleen, you're never ever supposed to winter prune an apricot. Last January, um, I just had this sixth sense that unless you're not gonna get rain, for let's say six weeks, then you should be able to winter prune an apricot, says conventional wisdom. I just had a weird feeling at the beginning of January that we weren't, weren't going to get any rain for six weeks. We had a huge, huge storm at the end of December last year. So I winter pruned my apricot. We didn't have rain for probably 10 weeks. We didn't have rain January, February, and most of March. So no rain. But I went against my sister, who's a certified arborist <laughs> I went against her advice and I pruned it because I had this weird feeling we weren't going to get any rain um so even though I was right about the rain I was wrong about the apricot so my apricot and he's just a brand new little guy he's only three years old um he uh got you typa so I will say do not do not prune your apricot tree probably starting from October all the way to May, you've got to summer prune your apricot. You can prune it in July, you can prune it in August. After you take off the fruit, my apricot's usually a, oh, at the other orchard, I have a June and a July apricot. So you can prune at the end of July, prune at the beginning of August, but do not prune in winter. It's stupid. And when, when the last time we taught the uh, winter pruning a fruit tree class, somebody asked me, um they had an aprium which is an apricot cross if they had to worry about winter pruning and i told them i didn't know and i also have an aprium in my yard and i winter pruned it and i have you type now too uh, okay so i learned the hard way that yeah it's apricots and it's um crosses, crosses. yeah don't Good prune in winter but that's now. not this class Okay, different class. <laughs> <laughs> okay, tree selection, chilling hours. So you need certain trees need a certain amount of chilling hours. And I just learned this yesterday. What the chill hours do is between 32 and 45, the, it suppresses the tree's hormones that tell it to grow. So it, it puts it into dormancy. And after a tree has gotten so many of those hours, then the hormone starts to be produced again and it breaks dormancy and it starts to grow. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so different trees have different requirements and that's the next slide. 
But then there's also heat units. <clears throat> like I'm on the coast. I can't plant something that that's going to be big and sweet, like a full size big peach just will not ripen up where I am. So you need to keep in mind if you're in a cool area, if you're on the coast, certain certain trees will do well and others won't. The smaller the fruit as a general rule, the smaller the fruit, the better it will do. Apples and are um yeah, apples and pears do fine everywhere as far as I know. Question? Yeah. So uh, the chill hours between 32 and 45. So after, let's say it's a, a tree that requires 600 chill hours, right after it gets its 600 chill hours, do the hormones then start flowing and telling it to grow or does it keep accumulating? Let's say there's another two or 300 chill hours to come. Uh, does it go ahead and break dormancy and go ahead and start letting that hormone flow or does it just keep uh, let's say it keeps under, you know, between 32 and 35 for another couple months. No, it'll break dormancy. It, it won't grow vigorously unless okay. it's warm, but it will break dormancy. Interesting. That's why you need to match your chill hours to where you live. Okay. Like okay. if you planted something with very, very low chill hours, mm -hmm. it might break dormancy and then get hit with cold weather that right. would set it back. Yeah. And below 32, I mean, we've had a serious frost. Yeah. Like uh, the last two nights, like it looks like snow's on the ground. For the last three weeks, we've had frost every single night. But below 32, that is not counting as a chill hour. Yeah, that doesn't count. And anything over 60, uh -huh. you then have to subtract from your chill hours. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So tree selection, I'm not gonna go into <clears throat> the hundreds and hundreds of different trees you can select, but I will refer you to a great, <clears throat> and you'll get this, the, this presentation, <clears throat> excuse me, but two really, really smart fruit tree people did a study in San Francisco and San Mateo counties and saw what trees work where, and they, they did a publication of it. Um, and they're from UC Davis. So here is an example of that. And you can see they, they put it into zones. So zone one is 600 to 1,000 chill hours, and it's the South uh, Cemetery County. And then the middle of San Mateo County, and then San Francisco and North San Mateo County. And what what I really like about this is not just did they list the fruit that will do well, but they also like um, oh, where's a no? Like the wine sap apple needs a pollinator. And then they also gave you harvest times. So it's a really useful publication. Okay, tree selection, pollination. Most deciduous fruit trees and almonds require pollinization by insect pollinators. Um, and the, most of them are self fruitful, meaning that a bee going to one flower on the tree can pollinate another flower on the tree. But some are not self fruitful they're self unfruitful, which sounds weird to me, but that's the language in all the literature I can find. Um, meaning you need the bee to go to another type of that tree, say a plum, and then go over to your plum, which is a different variety, and that will pollinate your plum. So just when you buy your, your trees, just make sure that it's either self fruitful or if it's not self fruitful, if it needs a pollinator, either you get the pollinator, um, don't buy that tree then because you don't have room for the pollinator or right next door, your neighbor has a Santa Rosa plum. <laughs> <laughs> and I say that because I put in a tree knowing my next door neighbor has a Santa Rosa plum 
and that pollinates my tree. And that's close enough. I, I actually, it's quite a, a long range yeah. um, that bees fly to pollinate your tree. But, you know, next door or next, next door, I probably wouldn't go further than that for pollinating. Lisa, any words of wisdom? Uh, no, so does every single flower have to, let's say it um, is not self-fruitful, every single flower to make a fruit has to be pollinated then by, that bee has to go from your flower to the other tree, back to your flower, every single flower to get a fruit. Yeah. Is that a true statement? That's a true statement. But also a true statement, even on a self-fruitful tree, is a bee has to go to every single flower to pollinate it. Yeah, sorry, I I just should tell everybody my um, internet's super unstable. So I'll if I freeze, um, usually I come back within a few seconds, but you answered my question, Kathleen, that the bee has to go to every single flower for it to become a fruit. Yeah, and, and then I said, and it has to go to every single flower on a self-fruitful tree as well. Yeah. Just like on a zucchini. Unless you want to go out there with a little paintbrush. And a zucchini, I think it's like 16 times or something. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. It doesn't just have to go once from flower to flower. It has to go back and forth and back and forth. And back. Anyway. Okay. All right. So here's just a description. This is from Trees of Antiquity. And I put this up just because, um, well, give some good information. Bloom period, meat season harvest period late, and then pollination requirement, it needs a pollinator with the same bloom period. So if you wanted to get yellow bell flower, you would also need to get another apple that blooms mid-season. Okay, so you can harvest fresh fruit in reasonable quantities from your garden from late spring well into winter. Factor in citrus if you live in a citrus friendly climate, which we do, and you can harvest fresh fruit from your garden year round. And look what I put in. Oh, that's a great, I love this slide. Yeah, this is on Dave Wilson's website and it shows, it shows the variety and when it's ready to be harvested. And you can see from here that, you know, early May all the way until December, December. Yeah. if you like persimmons, you can have fruit. Yeah. So what, what I do when I'm setting up an orchard for someone is I pick something in this general range and this general range and then in this general range to extend their harvest so that you don't have three apple trees that are ready to harvest all at once, but that you have one tree come in and you eat all those apples and then another tree come in and eat all those apples and another tree come in or yeah. process all those apples. And same with peaches, same with everything that you can, you can get an early, a mid and a late and you can have fruit all the time. And if, if you don't have room for three different peaches and you get a mid peach and an early plum and a late, whatever that is, I can't tell. But you can extend your harvest. It's amazing, but you can eat fresh fruit all the time. Yeah, and I will say I have an early treat peach, which is in May 10th. It's like the very first fruit here uh, for the peach. And it comes in in early May. I mean, in May, I am eating peaches. And then Kathleen designed my, uh, my home orchard. And I have three peach trees. I have an early, mid, and a late. And so I'm eating peaches the whole summer, from early summer to late summer. Yeah. And it's so delicious. This is, and again, Dave Wilson website. It's... It's there, that's great. So site locations, fruit trees must be grown in full sun. 
Even small amounts of shade reduce flower bud formation and fruit set. That's all I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> Put them in sun. Do not. And well, son, I, I, I had a fruit tree. I hired some people to put fruits in my backyard because I moved into a different microclimate. And they put a citrus in shade, part shade, and it was full of aphids and scales and it looked awful. So I took it out and I put in an ornamental there that, that does fine in part shade. So full sun, just... That's it, full sun. Full sun. Soil preparation. So um, we plant high, as do all the orchards in the Central Valley, even though they have soil that's wonderful. Um, plant up a foot or two. You would be amazed at how much better your trees will do if they're planted up high. You have good drainage, you're not gonna have root rot, you're not gonna have crown rot. Um, it's, it's just the way to plant. Lisa? Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'll add there is, so we don't dig holes when we plant trees. We mound native soil. We take the soil that the tree is gonna be growing in and we make a mound we put the bare root free tree down. We spread all those roots out. So it's like a spider coming over the mound. And then we put more, maybe you're going to go into this, Kathleen. A little bit. Okay. And then we put more native soil on top of those roots. So they're covered, they're in native soil. They're covered with native soil. And then we might sprinkle a little compost and sprinkle a lot of mulch. Uh, the only thing I'll say, when you're buying a bare root fruit tree, and Kathleen, you might get into this too, you're buying the roots. I mean, you're buying, of course, you're buying the scion on top, but look for really nice roots. Look for roots, you know, two-year-old, three-year-old roots that are hardy and healthy and, and take them out of their soil if they're in soil like um, some of the local nurseries take them out and look at the roots and make sure those roots are super healthy. Um, Kathleen and I did a consult a few months ago uh, for an uh, apricot orchard. And they said that they planted some apricots from bare root, but that it didn't have any roots. It was just a twig. And we're like, why, why would you plant that? You know, I mean... <laughs> I was almost, I, I can't remember the word when you like can't talk like catatonic. I was like, <laughs> I, I don't know why you would plant a bare root tree that didn't have roots, but <laughs> you probably planted it upside down. <laughs> I, at that point, I didn't even know what to say anymore. I was just like, okay. I mean, but, but in other words, you're buying roots. You're buying a really, when you buy a bare root tree, you're buying a good root system. So check out the roots, make sure they're healthy and happy and, and hearty. And, um, and the scion on top doesn't really matter because Kathleen will get into that. So don't worry about any branching. That's all going to go. So you're buying, look at the roots. That's what yeah. you're buying. Yeah. Look at the roots. And like my nursery down here, you know, I'll pull out a tree. They, they have them in sand and I'll pull a tree out and I'll be like, no, these, you know, uh, these roots look awful. And, you know, they have to bury them back in the sand, but I'm not going to take that problem home. Yeah, yeah. So, so be yeah, picky. That's a really good point, Lisa. Yeah, be totally picky. I mean, be it's picky. their job. Don't worry about it. Yeah, and also you're going to have that tree in your yard for 25, 30 years. You know, so you, you start off with a, with a nice tree. Yeah, yeah. So planting, plant high. And you can see, I made, I, I got this slide probably from UC, but um, I'm, I made the soil level down further because I think up here is too high. I wanna see a root flare. I wanna see this. It's like when you, when you see a Japanese maple and you, you can see it like this, you know? 
hopefully with every tree, actually, you can see it like that. But um, yeah, you definitely want to plant high, especially if you have clay soil. But even if you don't, you still want to plant high. You'll yeah. avoid so many problems. Yeah. So here's, here's that in the beginning of the class when I was showing you those bare roots. So this is where I would, right here, this brown line is where I would put the soil. And also it's gonna, um, it's gonna settle. So even if you plant it like crazy high, you'd be amazed how quickly it's, it's gonna settle down. And I circled this because this, this area of this tree was wet. I can tell by just looking at it that, um, and this, if this stayed wet, you would get all kinds of diseases. This is an open wound right here. So that's why you want to plant high. That so, part of the tree is not meant to be wet. Yeah. So Kathleen, when you bought this bare root tree, uh, it, it, I mean, there's a really, a drastic line where it's bark and then where it's that um yeah the, the rock color it must have been the soil must have been up at that line yeah. that that's amazing to me i mean because you'll read or, I, I actually this was a mail order tree uh-huh and it could be it rubbed against another tree in shipping okay i mean okay. I, I don't know how that damage occurred yeah but um it's actually pretty good looking roots huh those roots, uh, I, I was going to comment, those roots are fantastic. I mean, yeah. that's what you're looking at. When you buy a bare root tree, you want your roots to be. Yeah, see all these roots and all these little root hairs and this whole network that's going on there. All of that is going to take up nutrients and water when, you, when this tree breaks dormancy and starts to grow. Yeah, and you can see they're in a radial, they're they're going every yeah. way there is. So they're in a radial pattern all the way around. They're nice and thick and healthy and hardy. And then those, yeah, those little roots, right after you put them in the soil, they're going to start talking to the soil. You know, the soil's then going to start taking care of forming the bacteria and fungi. Are then going to start forming relationships with these roots. And that's going to be a super healthy tree. Yeah. Or maybe it already is. That's from, did you plant that a few years ago, Kathleen? I planted this for a client. Oh, okay. But I, I think it's a super healthy tree. It looks great. Yeah, should be. Unless yeah. there. So this is the root flare. I'm kind of, I know I'm kind of harping on this, but I, I really, I can't emphasize the importance of planting high. Yeah. In and fact, high. if anyone's heard of Linda Chalk or Scott, who wrote How Plants Work. I mean, she's brilliant, actually. Um, plant High is her mantra. <laughs> this, I just threw this picture in because I love it because this was in Burlingame and they took the sidewalk away from around this tree. Look at that poor guy. His roots had nowhere to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's sad. <laughs> And the only other thing I wanted to add is, like Kathleen said, they're set, like I planted my trees crazy high and I thought it was, this is probably two feet above grade and I thought it was way too high. Right now, you can't even tell. If you go into my home orchard right now, there's no way you could tell that I planted those high. Yeah. They it's settled. Plus you mulch the whole thing and you cover crop and it's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So here, here's my own backyard. And right in, I think you can see this hole here is where a tree was that was doing very poorly. Um, I tried to dig a trench to make the water go away and I just couldn't dig a trench deep enough. So I took the tree out. It, it just wasn't gonna do well. This was two years after it was in. So I, I dug a mound. And when I say I dug a mound, I, I went in a circle and I got a shovel full of dirt and I put it in the middle of the circle. So I built a mound that way. Oh, maybe that is that tree. And then I put this tree and I spread the roots out around it. 
Okay. I covered it with the native soil and put the irrigation around it. And since then I put compost and cover cropped and mulched and I fixed the irrigation that I broke. <laughs> <laughs> you and, have some really nice soil. That's yeah. why it's nice. Well, look at, look at this whole area is cover oh. cropped. Clover. Yeah, you've cover cropped everywhere. It was all micro clover, but um, yeah, it just, you know, it was feeding my soil like crazy. Well, I saw a ton of roots, uh, you know, in the previous picture, I saw a ton of roots. And so all those roots are just, yeah, it's, I mean, there's just, there's so much good uh, life in that soil. Yeah. Yummy, yummy, huh? Yeah, yummy, yummy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is it, uh, the Master Gardeners, um, San Mateo County Fairgrounds place. We planted a bunch of fruit trees. So you can see we didn't dig. Look around that, that mound. We, we, dug, we made mounds and we put the fruit trees in them. And the season before we had cover cropped with a really nice mix of grasses and uh, wildflowers. And they were cover cropping again around each tree. And I, when I make the first cut, which you'll see in a second, I take that, that stick that I cut off and I put the tag on it. Because I see so many trees with the tags on them and eventually that's gonna girdle your tree. Oh, so cover cropping. I had to throw in one cover cropping slide. We should all <laughs> cover crop. It's actually, it keeps more water in the soil if you cover crop than if it's bare soil. And I think Lingso has a cover crop class I did in their resources. Yeah, keep your soil covered. Yeah, so then oh. we mulched with the cover crop that we cut down, which how perfect is that? You don't have to go to the store and buy mulch. You just cut down your cover crop and there's your mulch. That's brilliant. An irrigation to be put in soon, I was told, and it <laughs> never happened. Oh, uh, is somebody hand watering those trees in summer? A bunch died. Oh, no. I know. I'm not that's happy awful. about that. That's awful. Yep. So you want to plant with the, uh, the graft bud facing north because that's a very vulnerable little spot on your young tree and there's less sun hitting it facing north so it won't get sunburned. And then you wanna paint the rest of the tree with a one-to-one -one ratio of white latex paint to protect from sunburn. It's, it's kind of like putting sunscreen on your tree. So here we are painting those trees at the county fair with a one-to-one -one base water and just get what's on sale. Or even if they, I know Orchard used to, you know, for like a dollar, if they mixed a paint that was incorrect, they'd sell it for close to nothing. Um, get that as long as it's light colored. Yeah. And I will say you do it the first year when you're planting it, but about every couple of years, you need to do it again because yeah. the, the tree grows for one thing. So it expands out and then there's a whole bunch that's not covered with the paint. Um, so you need to you need to do it every couple of years. It gets harder the first year. It's super easy to do because <laughs> there's nothing there. And then it's, you know, then, of course, it gets its scalping branches and everything else. So, yeah. So the most important cut you will ever make is 18 to 24 inches from ground to the to you just cut it's a it's the only heading cut i ever make is you just cut i actually try to cut to a bud but that's not important and that cut is you can see these trees were cut and then they got this really nice branch structure and they can keep these trees small. And that's the point of making that, that first cut so low 
is you're going to get low branches and you can keep your tree small so you don't have to haul out a ladder every time you want to do anything. So, um, and that's also why you want to get a bare root tree. If you get a, a tree in a, a box or even, you know, a 10 gallon tree, they have not made that first cut. So it's the most important cut and it's really hard to do. At least you want to tell the Kent story. <laughs> yeah. So our brother Kent, he has a big orchard. His orchard, he has almost like a five acre orchard. And Kathleen and I, this is quite a few years. Do you have the dog picture, Kathleen, at the end? I don't. That's a pruning class. Oh, darn. Okay. Um, anyway, um, so he put in a lot of trees. Kathleen designed the orchard for him. And so he has got great, great fruit trees. And then Kathleen came through and made that cut, made, um, made the 18 inch cut on every single tree. So it just looks, it really, it looks like a little toothpick sticking out of the ground. It looks like nothing. And Kent called me and said, you're never going to believe what Kathleen did. You know, she cut off all of my trees. I'm like, what? <laughs> what was she thinking? But, um, but I was like, no, she did the right thing. That's what you're supposed to do. And now he has a beautiful productive orchard other than he's got, he's got to go for, he's got some problems, but, um, but he takes a lot of fruit out of that orchard. He, yes, he does. It's a very, very productive orchard. Okay, first cut, 18 to 24 inches. It's hard to do, but do it. There's the first cut. I love this picture because some of the faces <laughs> of the people are like, oh. it's like, holy cow, what are you doing? <laughs> and that's even a little generous what you're Yeah, it is. Normally I would have gone lower, but but um the fence was right there and we're gonna try to espalier them. Oh, okay. So okay, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So here's the first cut just on those trees I had on the ground. And these, this was a little bit too low. So I decided to go up higher and these branches were actually really nice, nicely attached. Yeah. So I left them, I shortened them, but I left them and um, made that first cut. Yeah. And, you know, you can do this. Uh, a lot of nurseries will make that first cut for you if you want them to. So if you're buying your trees at a local nursery, they can make the cut for you. Um, it's easier to get them home in your car if you yeah, do that so first easy. cut. Otherwise, there's just like branches all over the place and it's pretty hard to get. So just doesn't matter when you make that first cut. You just have to make it. So exactly. So irrigation, this is according to UC Davis. Um, I actually don't irrigate my trees nearly this much. Mm -hmm. um, I have found, well, first roots need air as much as they need water, which not everybody realizes that, but they do need air. And the biggest problem I see in gardens is overwatering. It is much better to water deeply less often. I mean, the only thing I'll add there is when it's a brand new tree. Yeah. Um, really the first year, well, that's why you plant it in winter. For one thing, you get a lot of winter rains and that's also when bare root trees are available. But um, that first summer you, like Kathleen in that one slide where she had the irrigation around the tree, it'll only stay there like one year. And then it'll start moving out, moving out, moving out because the roots are gonna be moving out, moving out, moving out. But that first year you're gonna to have to, um, first year or two, you're gonna to have to keep that tree well watered in summer. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, even on the coast, I do not give my trees three gallons of water a day. Yeah. Not even close. <laughs> well, it's weird that they say per day because no, no tree should have water every day. You know, I, you know, I could maybe see with a first year tree, you know, maybe giving it nine gallons every three days. Nine gallons is a lot, but I could see that. Um, but but it's weird that they put the chart the way they did it, where it's on a per day basis, because 
you don't want to be watering anything every day. And the most you want to be watering even in the first year is every every two or three days. Yeah. Yeah. And I think these are actually recommendations for growers. Oh, huh. Which, no wonder we think the growers use too much water. Yeah, that's, yeah, wow. That's yeah. Interesting. I can't okay. believe with a canopy of 30 inches that they're putting 186 gallons a day on. That's crazy. That is crazy. Yeah. Okay. That's enough for me. Okay. Disease prevention. I'll go through each, each one of these. This is from Chuck Ingalls, who hmm. has passed, but was a fruit tree savant. Oh. <laughs> Well, no, actually, I think I do. Okay, so choosing a good planting site that gets full sun is mm -hmm. you're going to avoid almost every problem. Is if your tree is in good soil and has good sun, you're golden. You're not going to have most of these problems. Um, encourage naturally occurring biological controls, which if you cover crop, that will bring in the predators you need. Um, adopting cultivation, pruning, fertilization, and irrigation practices that reduce pest problems. Again, if, if it's a good site and we actually don't fertilize, we just add compost and cover crop and my plants are happy, my trees are happy. Um, you don't want to prune over prune a lot because that induces new growth and that's more yummy to insects. And don't overwater. And if you do have gophers, you can put up uh, gopher baskets. And almost every fruit tree I see even if you're really good about harvesting, you have some mummies, which is like the shriveled up old fruit. Get rid of those because those are little fungus bombs. Um, and just, you know, keep it fairly clean. Cover crop will help with that a lot. Trapping, washing off, pruning or screening out pests. I, I think rodents are probably the biggest pest when you get your harvest. Um, and it's it can be very difficult to control. I know I harvest harvested like my persimmons early because some rodent was stealing them. Mm. Or birds. Lisa has big squirrel problems. Yeah. And rats. And rats. Any solutions, Lisa? Um, I, I trap, I mean, um, and Kent traps. Um, I really think that's the only solution is trapping. Trapping's legal as long as you're trapping the, the ground squirrel, the East Coast ground squirrel, um, and euthanizing them is also legal as long as you're doing it humanely. Um, and that's all, if you go onto the UC website, you can get all that information since this class isn't really on that, but I, that's, to be honest, that's the only thing that I think works. Yeah. And the rats you trap? Trap. I trap rats and I trap squirrels. Yeah. It's pretty tough to screen them out on fruit trees. I know Lisa's husband built a concoction. Yeah kind of like a giant teepee to put over the trees. And if you only have one or two trees, that's possible. But if you have several trees, especially several trees that are in harvest at the same time, it's, it's very difficult. Yeah, and you need to be on flat. He built a huge cage and then it's out of, it was out of um, uh, like quarter inch chicken wire. So the rats couldn't get through, um, but, 
my orchard in, in Woodside's on a slope and it, it was just a real hassle. And what you see here is that'll keep birds off for sure. And I, I find I have bird damage with persimmons, but with my stone fruit, it's almost always squirrel and maybe some rat. And a squirrel and rat, they're just going to chew right through anything, any kind of a bird netting. They're going to just chew right through it. So really, I think the only thing you can do is, is trap. Um, I will say, and Janice Moody, another a fellow master gardener, is an expert at, um, at rodents. And so probably watch her um, presentation, but it's good over time after you garden for a while, you'll start recognizing the difference between raccoons, rats, squirrels, birds, snails. Um, <laughs> but there, yeah, in other words, I'm, I'm a vegetable gardener and I can tell the difference between a bird and a snail um, damage on vegetables. So you know, don't put out sluggo if you're having a bird problem. Don't put a bird net if you're having a slug problem. So you just, you really do, um, I don't know if you talk about this, Kathleen, but it comes down to observation and really, and curiosity. So really, really looking and being super curious of what caused that. And I mean, you can do infrared cameras, you can do a lot of things, but um, I think you need to you need to train yourself to be observant. We've gotten so much into the technology age that we don't see things anymore, but we need to see what we're looking at and we need to look at what we're seeing and, and figure out what's going on here and ask yourself questions. What's going on? Uh, okay, that's my soapbox. Yeah, no, very good. Pest oh. management. Almost every insect and mite pest that occurs in a orchard trees can fall victim to one or more biological control agents. Natural enemies suppress pest populations, keep them from leave, reaching levels. And the reason I put this picture in is when I was managing my brother's orchard, he had a cherry tree, which was covered in aphids. So this is what, like 10 years ago? Yeah, long time ago. So I thought, all right, I'm gonna spray neem oil on these aphids, which is an organic pesticide and good on me. And so I'm spraying the trees and I find this other nasty pest that I decide I'm gonna kill it too, because you know, it's a bug. <laughs> so I did. And then later I looked it up and found out I had killed all the soldier beetles, which were there to eat the aphids that were on his cherry tree. So if I would have just taken a step back and let these soldier beetles do what they do and not spray anything, everybody would have been better off. Yeah, yeah. So that's my humility <laughs> slide. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, Kathleen is, you know, almost all bugs are good. Almost all insects are good. It very few cause damage. So you just be really careful of what you're uh, on my orchard and in my vegetable garden. I do use sluggo for slugs, but only when I'm first planting out brassicas. Other than that, I don't use anything because um, you don't need to. Soldier beetles, lady beetles, things are going to come in and they're going to they're going to do what they're supposed to do. And so you don't you just have to step out of their way. Sometimes it takes a little bit of patience to step back and really leaves that are ugly. It's not the end of the world. And yeah. that's, that's all an aphid does to a cherry tree is it deforms the leaves. It doesn't really do any damage. Yeah. And if it's really bothering you, then just take, you know, a stream of water, yeah. a sharp stream of water, and then just wash off the aphids. But yeah, but I wouldn't put, it doesn't matter if it's organic or, well, I certainly wouldn't use inorganic, but there's no use to spend time and money on something that, um, that you don't need to. Yeah, exactly. And attitude is everything. Your expectations will determine what you consider success. Like That's my, my apples had worms. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> yeah. And then just cut out the worm and eat the apple. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, the worms aren't that bad. Yeah, Kathleen. <laughs> <laughs> so there's our references. And thank you, Lingso. Thank you, Lingso. And now Can can give us any questions we have. Yeah, we've got a few questions here. So let me go back. Yeah. Okay, so we're gonna start from the beginning here. Um, I think you mentioned uh, growing apricots and the question is, will apricots grow on the coast? Mm -hmm. I don't, right on the coast or in one of the little inlet valleys? Oh person's probably not there. If you're right on the coast where you're getting coastal fog, I wouldn't, they need more heat than that. Yeah, inland they're fine, I mean. Do you know of any varieties perhaps that may grow in the coast with the, the chill hours and all that? You know, I would go to Dave Wilson's website and they, he actually has a little section on low chill for like Southern California low chill and um, see if there's anything he recommends. I don't know of any. Okay. You could do, there is an apri ap aprium that is supposed to taste like an apricot hmm. that would probably do better because plums don't need as much chill or as much heat. Hmm. So yeah, I'd, I'd look at Dave Wilson and then call around the nurseries and see if anyone has them. Okay. All righty. So the next question is, um, Kathleen, you put up the UC ANR um, on the varieties of uh, species selection and all that fruit tree selection. Yeah. Uh, uh, someone's asking if there's a publication number on the varieties and if so for them, uh, for, uh, them to have. You know what? I'm stuck in my. If if you go to the UC ANR website and type in Catherine Jones, it will come in come up. Yeah, but I yeah. don't know the number, and um, I'm stuck. Your internet stuck. I think it's like I want to say like eighty six seventy or something. But that book, it's called the Home Orchard book. Maybe you already said that, Kathleen. I froze for a minute. No, but... the 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 little publication that that um Catherine Jones did about oh, okay. uh, San Francisco and San Mateo County oh okay yeah I don't know the number but I could get it quick okay um let's Sorry. do a new question here um this person's wondering if the full sun requirements still goes for weather over 130 10 degrees in the heat of summer? You know, I just read, it was on Trees of Antiquities, Antiquities website, where they said a little summer shade in inland hot areas would be okay. So, yeah. I, you know, I tell you the truth, you're out of my range of knowledge on that question. But I don't think anybody, anything wants to be over 110. If, if I had a tree and it was 110 out, I'd probably, and if it was sustained over days, I would probably put a shade cover over it. Yeah. For the hottest hour from three to five or something. But um, th that's, those are tough conditions. Well, this happened, Kathleen, this happened this summer in the Bay Area we had like two or three days in a row where it was really, really hot, like crazy hot. Yeah. Um, the good thing is, you know, when that weather is coming, I mean, now because of all the weather apps and stuff, you know, when that weather is coming, I would do a deep, deep water. Yeah. A few days ahead of time, uh, three, four days ahead of time, do a, a deep, deep watering of that tree. I have an avocado tree. Uh, at my woodside orchard and um, and avocados can take some heat and it that super super hot just about did it in it's coming back I mean it's now re-sprouting 
but if I would have given that tree a super deep watering ahead of the super hot weather, um, I, I think it would have fared way, way better than it really got crispy. It got totally, it, it defoliated, the entire thing defoliated in summer yeah. because of the hot weather. I mean, it's a lot of work to ask somebody to go put a shade cloth over their tree for a few hours a day and then take the shade cloth off and then put it back on. I mean, pretty much nobody's going to do that. I mean, maybe somebody would, but um, so I'd say the only thing I would do is, is make sure they're, they're well uh, hydrated. And if that's your environment every day for the summer, uh, I don't know, I'd plant cotton. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, even tomatoes. Wait, the publication okay. number is yeah. eight two six one. Oh, I'm so close. Yeah, I'm <laughs> impressed. And all I did was Google Samatail fruit trees, and it came up. Yeah. In the ANR website, on the ANR website. Kathleen, uh, Kathleen, was it eight two six one? You said yes. Okay. I'll type it into the chat there. Okay, so um, next question is, do you rehydrate the roots before planting, say 24 hours in advance? You know, it's interesting. Everything I read, I read says to soak the trees in water for six to 12 hours. I've never done it. Have you ever done it, Lisa? I haven't, I've done it on other, I've done it on cane berries. Uh, I want to say I've done it on asparagus. I've done it on other things, uh, strawberries, other things that I plant bare root. I haven't done it on trees, but I agree. Everything I read says to do it. So. <laughs> <laughs> but if they're, if they're well healed in and they're moist. Yeah. I don't think yeah. you need to. Yeah. I think the trick there is buy your trees kind of early. Like if they come into your nurseries um, right after Christmas, go ahead and buy those trees early. Don't wait until uh, February or March when they have like the ones that got picked over and nobody else wants um, because you don't know how those roots have been treated. So yeah, my guess is if you buy it and you heal it in or plant it that same day, you don't need to, but uh, if you feel like those roots haven't been treated well, then maybe you should. Yeah. But I think that's great advice, Lisa. Go early, like as soon as they come. Yeah, go early, go often. I, I waited, you know, sometimes I'm like a bargain basement shopper. Sometimes I've got my trees at the end of the bare root season. Uh, and they've done, they've done okay, but really you wanna get them in December, early January. Yeah, I, I got a, a peach tree at the end of the bare root season and it already started to leaf out. Oh, yeah. And I made the first cut and it killed it. Oh, okay. So don't, did, yeah, just go go December, go, go early January. Okay. Um, so there were quite a lot of questions about cover cropping. Um, but I, <laughs> I did share your uh, cover cropping video link in the chat so they can refer to that. However, let me ask this question because um, people want to know what your favorite cover crops um, are for under fruit trees. My favorite cover crop for under fruit trees, and as a master gardener, I'm supposed to give you three choices, but I'm just going to give you one. <laughs> <laughs> Nature seed low growing mix. It's a mix of um, wildflowers that don't get very tall. So they don't get in the way of the photosynthesis of your trees and fairly reasonable. They're out of Utah. Um, I, I really like the company. So again, nature's seed, they also have a California native wildflower mix which um, I just spread in the alley behind our house. We'll see if my neighbors notice or not, but <laughs> um, yeah, I, I cover crop. I'm kind of like the Johnny Appleseed of cover crops. I throw seeds wherever I go. 
Yeah. Yeah. I just cover crop to 10. Well, at my, at Kent's house, at um, our brother's house, threw out tons and tons of California wildflower seeds. Um, and in my own orchard, I just seeded same thing. I also, I, they're more expensive, but learners. Yeah. Um, if you want, um, if you want perennial cover crops, I do both annuals and perennials, but learner, learners has probably 20 different kinds of lupin. Um, and then, and then a whole bunch of different kinds of poppies and they have so many nice, and they and also they, have, they have what, what are the little ones with, with their white, with little blue spots on the ends of their petals? Oh, Namisia. Um, yeah, those are great for under, I mean, I, I would mix those with something. I like to have a variety of at least eight in yeah. any mix I throw out, but, um, or even a bag of Renee seeds or a uh, canister of Renee seed, wildflower seeds that you get in the nursery. That's yeah. a great cover crop. And I also cover crop though. I usually put in a grass. I usually put in either yeah. some oats or some alfalfa. Um, so I mix it in with other stuff. I put in some clover, to, depending on how big your orchard is, I usually mix in some clover and, um, and then the nice thing is, because Kathleen and I are lazy gardeners, is a lot of the things, if it's a perennial, it'll be a perennial, so it'll be there forever. But um, a lot of the annuals just reseed themselves. So you cover crop and then you don't have to keep cover cropping because they'll just keep reseeding and you'll just have, I just noticed the other day, all my fava are up. You know, I let my fava all just go to seed and it's now popping up all over in my orchard. And um, so anyway, um, I keep cover cropping, but you know, if you have a nice, a nice blanket of, of cover crop, it'll reseed itself and you don't have to do it every year. Yeah. And just before this rain, I went out in my own backyard and I just threw a bunch of California native seeds around that I got from nature seeds and, you know, I'll see how they do, but I'm just always throwing seeds out if it's moist. If it's really dry out, there's no point. They won't germinate. Yeah. But, but do watch the cover crop because um, we also cover crop in our vegetable garden. So we're big, we're big cover croppers. Never have bare soil. We don't go out bare. Don't let your soil be bare. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. So, um, Next question is regarding gophers. Um, this person has gophers and it'd be hard to put a mounded tree in a gopher basket. Um, they're wondering if you have any suggestions. Um, I actually have done it. If you get, and this is hard because you have to come down to Santa Cruz to get the baskets. But I had a client in Woodside that had a huge gopher problem and they're called Gophers Unlimited. I think you can get them online. They're these really sturdy baskets. And we dug down, oh, I don't know. You were with me, Lisa. We dug down probably a foot. Yeah. Put the basket in that. And then we mounded within the basket. Yeah. It put native soil in the basket and then yeah. still build a mound and still put the tree on top of the mound and still put native soil on top of the, the roots. Uh, but basically it was in a basket does stick up over the top of the soil a little bit but yeah. you kind of want that because the little gophers sometimes they'll, they'll they, crawl over a, a basket yeah so it you do you actually do want it to even though it's a little bit of a tripping hazard um you do want that sticking out of the soil a bit so you uh so that little gopher won't come out and get into the gopher basket Okay. All righty. So next question is, if you didn't make the heading cut the first year or decided it was too high, can you cut again in the later years? There's a 50-50 chance that you'll kill the plant. Yeah. We get that question all the time. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe the second year, but after that, I'd say no. I I would make, I would cut down to... A, a pretty good sized branch and you should then get some some branching below the cut 
but I wouldn't cut below branches because the the tree's too old to take a cut like that. You you just taken all of its photosynthates. Okay. And I only say that from experience. Like I said earlier, I got a peach tree that was just starting to leaf out, that was bare root. And I made that first cut and it died. Wow. Mm -hmm. oh. All righty. So next questions uh, regarding stink bugs. Um, <laughs> do you have any bi biological methods for uh, getting rid of stink bugs? They're, it's you know. funny. I just read about stink bugs. Did you know soldier beetles are in the stink bug family? Oh, I didn't know that. Stink looks bugs so eat plants, some of them, others of them. Um, I, you know, are they, are they damaging anything? If they're not really damaging anything, I leave them alone. Cause if you crush them, they're going to stink you. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you could go on the UC IPM website and, and type in stink bugs, but their basic advice was, yeah, you know, they do some damage, they eat plants, some, you know, they'll chew on your plant some, but there's not that much to do. Yeah. Yeah. Are there, do they have any natural predators at all? Do you know? Probably birds, but I don't know for sure. Yeah, yeah but maybe in their larva state. I don't know. I don't yeah. know yeah. if they're there. Okay. Alrighty, so next question is, are berry trees in general healthier than potted or burlap bound trees? I would say yes. I mean, that's gonna depend on the grower. It, the East Coast, they do a lot of- a lot of um, Ball and burlap. Ball and burlap. Um, in fact, the, the, the place in Woodside where she bought the 36 inch boxes, they were bald and burlapped and then put in boxes. And when they were planted, they didn't take the felt off. Um, I have had better luck with bare root trees. Generally, if you're getting something that's grown in a pot or is bald and burlapped, it's bigger and it hasn't been pruned properly. So, for those reasons, I prefer bare root. Plus the cost, I prefer bare root. So Kathleen, with ball and burlap though, I mean, that basically is bare root, right? I mean, you would just take it home, take off the burlap, take off all the soil and plant it bare root. Yeah, but it's a bigger tree. It is bigger when it's ball and burlap. Yeah, yeah, to do for the expense of ball and burlapping, they do bigger trees and then okay. generally they put them in boxes. Okay. All right. Well, then I would just, I'd kind of vote for the bare root then. Yeah. I don't know why you would get a bald and burlapped or a container tree if you could get for $45 a bare root and be able to look at the roots and know you're getting a good tree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you have any other bare root tree nursery um, suggestion other than Dave Wilson? Um, I like trees of antiquity a lot. And what's the place up north, Lisa? Well, I don't know if um, Arboreum, is that what you're thinking of? Yeah, Arboreum. No, I'm thinking of they're in like Portland. Oh, Rain, oh tree. Rain Tree. Rain Tree has a nice selection, although. Anything online this late in the year, you're going to be limited what's available. Um, and what's the place where we went and did a tasting? I thought that was Dave Wilson. No, I think it was Laharn. La oh, anyway, know. there's, there's, it's Dave Wilson and another grower provide bare root to nurseries. You can't buy directly from Dave Wilson unless you're a grower and you're buying hundreds of trees. Um, but for mail order, well, Fedco, F-E-D-C-O, but they're back east. Um, 
that's kind of yeah i mean i will say dave wilson trees are are good they're good quality trees they're kind of tried and true if you want something a little more exotic a little more interesting then i would do trees of antiquity um there used to be um a company called arboreum and my my old orchard is all arboreum trees i can't find them anymore i'm not sure if they're still i don't think they're around i don't think they're in business anymore which is really sad they were the um orchardist for Philole. These guys really, really, I think they literally had like PhDs, um, uh, palmology. Um, and I don't know, I'm not sure, I don't, I'm not sure what happened to them. Okay. All right. Um, next question is, will there be a class on fruit tree diseases? Hmm. I don't know, that's up to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> like well the biggest diseases are peach leaf curl and fire blight and maybe you type a yeah and you type a but um peach leaf curl you spray copper mm. um it's super bowl time fire blight you get a tree that's resistant or you cut it down you type a, you don't prune in the winter. Yeah, with peach leaf curl, the only thing I would say is uh, some years are worse than others. I mean, you almost always get some peach leaf curl on peaches and nectarines. I don't spray with um, copper because it's a fungicide and peach leaf curl is a fungus um, because then that's gonna drip onto my soil and it's gonna kill the fungus in my soil and I don't wanna do that. So the tree will defoliate and then it'll, refoliate so i don't worry about peach leaf curl yeah i don't spray for peach leaf curl either i know it'll shorten the life of my peach a little bit because the defoliating and refoliating takes energy but i would rather do that than be spraying copper that being said i am um, I have some clients that hate peach leaf curl, so I spray there. Yeah, it, hmm. it again, it gets into tolerance of what you can, what you can tolerate. Um, okay, um, I've never heard of this, but perhaps you both have. Um, have you ever tried the Ellen White fruit tree planting method? Hmm. I don't know it. I don't know it. If the person's on the line, they could speak. Yeah, I've never heard of it before. I haven't either. Interesting. Ellen White fruit tree planting method. Maybe we could Google it later, but okay. Moving on to next question. Should you prune your fruit tree after the first year, as in should you prune the second year or wait until, you know, three years? prune prune um, just regular pruning i regular prune every year yeah the first three years are your most important years because that's when you're really getting the structure of the tree established but we're doing a pruning class um through link so january 11th so you could tune in then for how to prune okay all righty so here's the last question um, if an orchard is infected with fire blight on the old trees, does it affect the younger trees? Oh, I just looked up the Ellen White. Mm -hmm. I would not use that method of planting. All right. What is that, Kathleen? What's the Ellen? Um, you start by digging a hole three feet wide and three feet deep in which to plant your young fruit tree, separate the topsoil from the subsoil that is dug from the planting hole. In the bottom of the hole, place a couple pieces of four inch drain pipe and plug up the ends with stones. Wow. I, I don't work that hard. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's unnecessary to work that hard because yeah. nature knows- You wanna plant high. <laughs> 
Yeah, you want to plant high. You don't want to plant. The reason why they're putting all this pipe in with all these drainage holes is because they're planting way too low. If they're doing a three feet by three feet hole, if they planted high, you don't have to do any of that. They're worried about they're worried about drainage is why they're putting a bunch of rocks in a pipe. But yeah, j just plant high and then you don't have any drainage issues to worry about. I mean, three feet deep, you couldn't do a bare root three feet deep. That's right. Sorry to say, I don't know who Ellen White is, and I'm sorry, but that's a ridiculous <laughs> method. <laughs> I'm sorry if I've offended somebody. Do the opposite of that. Plant build a mound. Build a three foot mound and put your tree on top of it, not a three foot <laughs> hole. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, sorry, Kay, what was the question? <laughs> hey, we all learned something new today, so that's that's great. Um, yeah. I forget what was okay. So here's the question: um, uh, Fire blight on older trees will it affect younger trees in an orchard? Yes. Yeah. If if they are pears, pears I find are the worst for fire blight, and yeah, because the fire blight is transmitted by a bee, it lands on the tree with fire blight, and it gets some of the bacteria on it. And then it goes over to the young tree and it lands on its flower and it infects the young tree. So you wanna cut out any fire blight that you see on a tree as soon as you see it. Um, I have a pear that uh, an entire branch got fire blight. I didn't get to it. I'm actually gonna replace that tree and get one that's resistant because they do have resistant trees. If you get rootstock OHXF333 or they have different numbers now, but it's O capital O capital H small X capital F. Um, that rootstock gives some resistance to the scion and you should have less or no fire blight. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it'll be transmitted within your orchard. It'll be transmitted from your neighbors. It'll be, yeah, fire blight is, it's a tough one to control. And it just looks like fire. Fire blight looks like some something came in and torched your palm fruit, your, your apple or your pear or your Asian pear. Uh, so right when you see that, that torch look, just cut, I can't remember what they say, three inches below or, um, but cut it off. Yeah, and if you're really vigilant, you can actually see the flower buds have it and you can just snap them off. But um, I don't know anyone that vigilant. Yeah, and then don't, that's, there's very few things we don't put in our compost pile. We put almost everything in the compost pile, but fire blight, I don't put in the compost pile. Field bindweed, I don't put in the compost pile, but, um, so then just that little bit, because it has the bacteria still on it. So just put it in the garbage instead of the compost. Yeah. And if any any gardener comes by and tells you he can cure your tree of fire blight or keep fire blight off your trees, don't hire him. <laughs> or her. <laughs> or her. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Actually, last question. Uh, have you heard of planting trees in... Um, clusters like 18 inches apart you know like three trees 18 inches apart and if so like what are your thoughts on that method yeah the three in one hole um if if you know how to prune them properly i think it's a great idea if you have a small garden but you have to prune all three of them as if they're one tree so it's it's a little bit tricky but i think it can be done yeah but you're gonna prune, so it's like one trunk, even though it's three trunks. So anything going towards the other trunks is gonna be pruned completely off. So it's only outward facing branches on all three trees. So I haven't done it, but I know I know people who do do it. Yeah, if you have a small backyard, it's a great I, idea. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. But you just have to be aware that the pruning is gonna be a little funky. All right. Does it still fruit pretty efficiently if you keep it pruned and, and contained in that cluster? Yeah. 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 Okay. And, and especially if you like need a pollinator, 
you can, you know, you can get a pollinator and put it 18 inches from the tree that needs to be pollinated. I mean, there's there's some good reasons to do. In fact, Dave Wilson's website has a section on um, on three in one fruit trees. Mm. Okay. All righty. Um, we're gonna go back to the fire blight one more time, and then we'll that'll be the end. <laughs> the questions: uh, Does fire blight cause cracks in the bark and peeling in the limbs and lower trunk? No, that sounds like sunburn. Yeah, that does sound like sunburn. Hmm. Don't you think, Lisa? Yeah, I mean, fire blight, it's pretty hard to miss. I think you could just Google it. I mean, it looks like somebody went in there with a blowtorch and torched your tree. It's a very distinct look. And what that uh, question's describing, I would, I would agree, it sounds like sunburn to me. And fire blight is only on pears and apples. That's it. Well, for fruit trees, it's on all kinds of other stuff, but... It's only on pears and apples. Oh, and quince. Quince for, and for fruit trees. And Asian pears, anything in the palm family. Yeah. Okay. All righty. Well, that's that's pretty much all the questions. All right. Thank you. Thank, Any thank, you, thank you, everybody, for coming after spending three years on Zoom. And thank you, Can, for having us. Of course. Thanks to both of you. Um, thanks to all our attendees. And this class will be online under community resources. So, but we'll see you both next month. For Sounds your, good. Yeah. We'll see you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.